All right, open your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 18, the 18th chapter of the book of Jeremiah. That's in the Old Testament, if you didn't know that. If you don't have a traditional Bible, but you'd like one, just raise your hand. One of my friends will give you one. You can either borrow that or you can keep it. It's our gift to you. Or you can take your digital device and you can open the U version. or It's also called the Bible app. All the notes and scriptures, everything except pictures have already been uploaded. If you don't have that app, download it now. It's amazing. It is obviously my favorite app. There's all sorts of different things. There's lots of different translations and versions of the scripture. There's places that you can interact with people. You can, it's kind of like a Bible, social media, for lack of a better term. There's places where you can do reading plans, and you can do those reading plans together. You can have accountability with each other. And so download that. It's called Version, or it's called the Bible app. If you're watching us live on our online campus or at one of our services at the Brown County Correctional Facility or at our site in Howard Swamico, welcome. We love you. We're so glad that you're part of our family, and we love you guys. Super glad that you're part of our family, bright and early, monstered up. Up, you know, let 61 grams of sugar in that can in Jesus' name. So you're welcome. And so uh, for all of you health people, just don't drink it, all right? Like Pastor Sonny said. And so listen, would you just give Jesus a big hand today? Can we just do that? And we heard the great... Sometimes I think we come from like this ecumenical liturgical background where we feel like we got to sit down, shut up, fight, fight, fight. But listen, you can be loud in here. It's, it's I right for you to be in here and say things like amen and yes and ooh, that's good. And when she says a you know, story about a kid being rescued from suicide, it's okay for you guys to like uh, erupt in applause and get excited about it because, you know, there's nobody with a ruler who's going to come around smack you in the knuckles for what it is that you're doing. And so we're so excited that you're kind of redefining church here. That's what I feel like Life Church is kind of doing here in the 920 and beyond and with things like the downtown site and with our uh, Fox Valley site and obviously with online. I mean, so many thousands of people that watch us live online. And so it's amazing. I don't know if you knew this, but we're actually on TV in Sacramento, California. I was like, what? Why aren't we on TV here? Why are we on TV in Sacramento? Why aren't we on, why aren't we on like whatever channel in this city? And so anyway, so glad that, that church can just be different. I just, I love church. I don't know about you. So when I show up here, I'm not, thank you. I'm not just like punching a card or filling a space. Like I, I love the whole thought of church, the idea of church. Like it's one of those things. I, if I had one month to live, I wouldn't be going, well, I'm not going to church. I could tell you that. Like I'd want to come here and see all my peeps before it was time to go. And I'd want to, I'd want to, and listen, if I had one month to live, Corona or not, I'd hand out high fives. You know what I'm saying? I'd be, there'd be no fist bumps for me. I'd be kissing people. I just kissed my friend, uh, uh, Bruce on the head. I walked in. I love that guy. I just said, you know what, man, Corona or not, if I'm going out, I'm going out by loving somebody. I saw a thing online this week. It was a super dad joke, by the way. It was an online dad joke, so it was a progressive dad. A guy said, if I get the coronavirus, I also want Lyme disease because you can't have your corona without your Lyme. <laughs> that's so great. That's the best. That's just, listen, if we can't make light of it, we're all going to die. You know what I'm saying? And so anyway, let's just, let's go out together, okay? And so I love that this has uh, been such an interesting series. I hate kind of that it's the end. It's been really reflective. For some, it's actually been very uh, revealing. It's, uh, it hadn't been scary for me. It's, it's not been because I've been thinking about this stuff like for a long time. Like what would I do if I knew that this was the end? For some people, they've been a part of this series and it's caused them to hit the pause button, especially for inquisitive people. I'm an inquisitive person. I love to to learn. I love to just know stuff. And it doesn't have to be important stuff. I mean, it can be either meaningful or meaningless. Some of my favorite knowledge in my brain is completely meaningless. I, my favorite TV character of all time is Cliff Clavin from Cheers because he just knew stuff that nobody else cared about. And there's something about me that I love to know like random little quirky things that nobody else to me, like it doesn't matter to me if it's meaningful. I just love 
to learn, love to know stuff. And I come by that honest. Many of you know that I talk about my dad. My dad was an inqui- is an inquisitive person. He's a learner. He asks lots of questions. Sometimes he asks questions of one person just so he can then turn around and ask the same question of another person. Like when he, when he asks the first person, he doesn't know the answer. But then when he asks the second person, he already knows the answer. It's kind of his way of transferring information. In fact, he's known by my brothers and I for starting conversations with questions. One particular question, really, with did you know? And then he, he was always armed. My dad was always ready with some sort of random, weird, obsolete, meaningless thing that he knew you wouldn't know. Actually, half the time, he didn't know it either. We just felt like maybe he made it up. This was before the internet, before you could like background check, before you could go on Snopes or Drudge Report. Like you just knew that if dad said it, it was something that you should know. And so sometimes, he's asking questions to receive knowledge, but other times he's asking questions to relay knowledge. And so because of that background, I'm an inquisitive person. I'm a question asker. I like to know what molds people, moves people, and makes people. And part of that is like, I think that humble people ask questions. And I think that because it takes humility to ask people questions because by nature, asking questions is admitting a deficiency. It's acknowledging and admitting that you know something and I don't know it. And so if you know something and I don't, I want to know it. So this has been an inquisitive series. It's been asking what makes you, what molds you, what moves you by posing this particular question. If for some reason you knew that you only had one month to live, what would you do? And it's a weird question. It can be an off-putting question, but it's a very important question because you only have one life. This is not the rehearsal. There are no do-overs. In fact, Hebrews 9 says, it is appointed for man to die once. So since you only have one life, it's reasonable that you would ask yourself, am I making the most of it? Am I wringing it out? Am I maximizing my impact? Am I living passionately, learning humbly, loving completely? When the last piece of sand falls to the bottom of the hourglass, will you be able to leave boldly? That's what I want to talk about today. Leave boldly. Let's pray. God, we love you. We honor you. We're grateful to you. God, thank you for this day. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for the sun and like 40 degrees, which in Wisconsin is basically 90. And so today, thank you for beautiful weather, God. Let us not take it for granted. Let us not take any opportunity that you present to us today for granted. God, let us live. Let us love. Let us learn. And God, today, if this, you forbid, we're the last day of our lives. Let us maximize it today, God. Let us not squander it. Let us not waste it. God, we love you. Thank you for the gifts that you've given us in Jesus' name. Amen. So according to UNICEF, approximately 360,000 people are born, while 150,000 people die globally every day. When those 360,000 people are born, there's almost no thought of them ever becoming one of the 150,000 who will die every single day because there is something inside of us that refuses to contemplate or consider death, particularly when we're young. We think we have our whole lives ahead of us. We've got nothing but time, but somewhere along the line, time speeds up. Time runs out. I mean, the global average life expectancy is 71 years. Y'all, a lot of us are more than halfway there. And so at 46 years old, my perspective has started to change. Maybe I should eat less sugar or drink less sugar. Maybe I should eat less red meat. Maybe I should eat more vegetables or or vegetables. Maybe I should (laughs) drink less beer and more water. Maybe I should exercise more. Maybe I should take the stairs rather than the elevator at 46 years old. I look at my kids and I wonder how they got so big. I wonder how they got so old. 
How do I only have two years left with my son and three with my daughter? What do you mean they're going to move out of my house? Maybe I should take the time I have with them now and not take it for granted. Maybe I should spend more of that time with them. Maybe I should talk to them more. Maybe I should be teaching them more, training them more. Our life together is fleeting. And so the book of James says life is but a vapor that appears for a little while and then it vanishes away. One interpretation says life is but a mist. It's like smoke when you look at it in the air. It looks so thick. It looks so solid. But the more you reach for it, the more it fleets away, the, the more ethereal. It becomes life is but a mist. It is but a vapor. It is here today. It is gone tomorrow. It is fleeting. I am over halfway there. How's my son going to know how to shave if I don't teach him? How's my daughter going to know how to change the oil in her car if I don't teach her? How's my son going to know how to treat a lady if I don't train him? Or how's my daughter going to know how she should be treated by a man if I don't train her? I don't want my kids to be taught by Google or trained by YouTube. So the book of Proverbs says, train up a child on the way that they should go. And in the end, they will not depart from it. Don't you want your life to matter? Don't you want it to make a difference, to make an impact? Don't you want your life to last? Don't you want to leave a legacy? Don't you want to be able to leave boldly? Of course you do. We all do. No one wants their lives to be forgotten. No one wants their lives to be an afterthought. So today I thought, let me leave you with three questions, three things that we need to ask ourselves if we're going to leave a legacy, if we're going to leave boldly. And I actually get all of these questions from the book of Jeremiah chapter 18 verses 1 through 4. It says, this is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house and there I'll give you my message. So I went to the potter's house and I saw him working at the wheel. But the pot that he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. From those four verses, let me give you three questions we need to answer so we can leave boldly. Here's the first. What will be the center of my life? The center. All of our lives are centered on something. They all revolve around something. For some, it's money. For others, it's success or status, achievements or accomplishments, family or hobbies. Yesterday, I saw lots of people whose lives were revolving around the Fox River. They're, listen, here in Wisconsin, man, Jack, if it gets 40, people come out, don't they? People were outside, no coats on, short pants, boats were out. I looked at my daughter and I said, I wonder how many of those men are out on those boats right now. And, and their wives were like, baby, this is the only day. Can we come spend some time together? And he said, baby, this is coronavirus out. What are we going to do if the grocery stores run out? I got to catch some fish. We got to put some fish in the deep freeze so in case something goes wrong. And I thought, brilliant way to use modern events for your benefit. Bro, people were out, man. It was like there were more boats than there were water. There are no fish left in the fox right now. And some people, that's their thing. That for some people, it's fishing. For some people, it's shopping. For some people, it's soccer. We all have something at the center of our lives. But the question is, is it solid? Is it sound? Is it secure? Now, I don't know a whole lot about pottery or throwing clay, but, but when I was in seventh grade, I had an art teacher who was an artist and a master potter. His name was Mr. Irwin. And y'all, he was out there. Before we knew what out there was, he was out out there is all I'm saying. He was flamboyant. He wore lots of jewelry and scarves. He was the first person I ever knew who wore an ascot. I'm talking about he looked like Rip Taylor from the gong show. Look at this right here. <laughs> Anybody under 40 doesn't even know what the gong show is, but that dude was out there is all I'm saying. Mr. Irwin was crazy, but he could throw some clay. He was a master potter, and he taught our class that the most crucial part of throwing clay is to keep the clay at the center of the wheel, which sounds easy, but it isn't. It takes lots of practice. You have to do it over and over and over. You have to do it until you get a feel for it, until it becomes second nature. Because if the clay isn't at the center of the wheel, it'll spin out of shape, it'll spin out of control. I, I want you to think about it like this, like this wheel. In every wheel, you have a center 
or a core, and you have all sorts of different spokes. And these spokes, they can be just about anything that you can imagine. They can be family, they can be friends, they can be finances, they can be work, they can be school, they can be goals, they can be hobbies. And here's the deal. You can have all these spokes. You can have all of this stuff in your life. In fact, you have to have these spokes in your life. You have to have the different stuff in your life because it says that variety is the spice of life. But none of these spokes can be at the center. None of these spokes can be the core. Because if you try to put any of these spokes at the center as the core, this whole thing will cave. This whole thing will crumble because those things were never created to support. They were not to be the core. They weren't designed to carry the load. It's why Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Watch this. And all these things will be added unto you. When you put Jesus at the center as the core, you can add more spokes to the wheel. You can add as many spokes to the wheel as you want. There's hardly any spokes on this wheel, honestly. I, I used to have a bike when I was a kid. It was a, uh, I won't tell you what we called it, but it, it was, a, it was a, a, a who ride, that's what we'll call it. And it, it, had, uh, the, it had 150 spokes in the wheel. You couldn't see nothing but spokes. It was so dope. I mean, it was like, and, uh, if you go watch the movie Baby Boy with Therese, that, Tyrese, that's what the bike looked like. It was like big handlebars and 150 spokes to where you couldn't even see light come through it. And there was still room in that for there to be more spokes. Because when you put Jesus at the center, you can add as many spokes as you want. That's how Pastor Sonny and I have our hands in so many things because we put Jesus at the center as the core and then we allow him to be the support of everything that he asks us to do and calls us to do. So for you, what is at your center? What is at your core? Here's the second question. We have to ask ourselves, what will be the character of our life? Character is incredibly important to God. Your character is who you are at your center, at your core. It's who you are when nobody is looking. It's what website you're on at 2 a.m. while everyone else is in the bed. Your character is who you message on social media or who you entertain messages from. Your character is what you think when your coworker takes credit for your idea during their presentation or what you say when someone cuts you off in traffic. And character is so important to God that he is constantly working it because God is more interested in your character than he is in your comfort. And so because he wants you to have deep, meaningful character, he is constantly refining you. He is constantly purifying you. And so the 66th Psalm says, for you, God tested us. You refined us as silver is refined. Requirement requires heat because heat removes impurities. Between my freshman and sophomore year in college, my dad got me a job at Ford Motor Company. And, and uh, every year, I think they still do this, every year they hire uh, students who are, who are the, the children of their employees. And they let them work there during the summer that you're only allowed to work there 89 days. Because once you've worked 90 days, you become a member of the United Auto Workers or in Canada, the Canadian Auto Workers. And, and then you're, you get a significant pay raise and discounts and these amazing benefits. And so I worked this job at Ford for 89 days. And the first job that I had when I got there, uh, the crankshafts would come down the assembly line and I had a a chisel that was an air compressed chisel. And I, I was assigned to three specific spots on every crankshaft that would come down. And the crankshafts come down like every seven seconds. And so the crankshaft will come down, you gotta stop it, and you take your little air chisel, zzz, 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 and you knock these three things off, you let go, and then the next side, zzz, 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 three spots, and the guy at the end of the line, he throws it in the basket. And so for about the first three weeks, I was the guy zzz, 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 taking the little burrs off of the crankshaft. And, and then they came to me and they said that they had a new job for me. And my, my second job was the crankshafts would come and they would come out of the mold and there would be four crankshafts on a T. 
and on each side of the T, there would be two crankshafts, and at the bottom, they would be joined together with a thing that kind of looked like a dumbbell. And so my job, when they came in the basket, there'd be dozens of them in there, and I'd have to lift them out of the basket and lean them up against the basket and take a sledgehammer and then knock the little dumbbell-looking thing off the end and then knock the crankshafts off of the T and then break the T and then throw the T back in the basket. And then when the basket was filled with spare T parts, then the uh, forklift would come and he would drive it away and he would take it somewhere. And I'd never knew where it went. I didn't care. My job was just to break down the crankshafts and put them in the basket so that the next guy could take the little burrs off. And so finally, after about another three weeks, they came to me and they told me they had another job for me. So I was excited because I hated that job because the tees that came out were 85 pounds. It was all day lifting 85 pound things out, 85 pounds. It was awesome for your workout, but terrible for your back. And so they said, we got a new job for you. This is like the Super Bowl of jobs for students here. And I thought, yes, finally, I've made it. I busted enough crankshafts. Hallelujah. Except I didn't know that word back then. And so they took me and they brought me a little... Uh, equipment shack and said, you're not going to need those coveralls anymore. And so they handed me a suit, special suit. It's like a hazmat suit. You zip it all the way up and there was a helmet that you had to put on. I didn't, am I going to the moon? Oh my gosh, I finally, are we building cars on the moon now? No wonder Ford is the best. And so he put the thing on and there's the oxygen. And the suit would fill up and you're clean and breathe air, uh, breathe it, clean and breathe air, breathe in clean air. And so they took me up to the top of the factory. I worked in a foundry and they took me up to the top of the factory. And, and, and at this lip, this mouth would come out this molten lava, legitimately like red, like, ah, am I in, like, is Lucifer up here? Is he the foreman? And the stuff would come out and they gave me a ladle, like a scoop, like a spaghetti strainer and I had the hazmat suit on and I had to watch for chunks. And if there were chunks, I had to, you know, scoop the chunks out of the lava and put them in another little belt. And then the chunks would go to another place. I don't know, chunk heaven or whatever. And this way I delivered them from hell. Always was called to be a pastor. And so I scooped them out. And it did that like 12 hours a day. And it was like 142 degrees up there. It was the worst job I ever had in my life. I didn't know who I pissed off, but I was up for some reason. I was up there. It was ridiculous. And so, I mean, I lost 78 pounds the first day that I was up. It was the worst job I've ever had in my life, but it was so important because if I miss any chunks, those chunks went into the mold and they, and as they dried, there would be impurities in the parts and those parts would go into somebody's car and, and somebody would break down on the side of the road. So for 12 hours, you got to focus and it's got to be like a laser because you know that somebody's Life may depend on whether or not you get that chunk out of that lava. And so sometimes God has to allow the heat to be turned up in our lives so the impurities will rise to the surface so that they can be more easily removed. And he's not picking on you. He's purifying you. If you want to be a person of character, you have to submit yourself to the refinement process. The prophet Isaiah said, you, Lord, are our father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Once we've centered our lives in Jesus, Jesus, we have to trust his process. The clay has to allow itself to be molded by the hands of the potter. Look again what Jeremiah said about the process. He said, but the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seems best to him. The clay, it was marred. Marred just means to detract from the perfection or the wholeness or to spoil. Have you ever had something detract from your wholeness or your perfection, cause your attitude to spoil? Of course you have. We all have. Jeremiah said the clay was marred. He doesn't say how it was marred. Was there a pebble in the clay? Was there a streak in the clay? Was there too much moisture? Was there not enough moisture? I don't know how it was flawed or how it was marred. And I don't know how you're flawed or you're marred. I don't know what the mistake was. All I know is how the potter responded, how he reacted to the mar. He doesn't reject the clay or remove it from the wheel. He reshapes it. He remolds it. He remakes it. He redeems it. And that reminds me of me because I am marred. I've got faults, flaws. I've got flakes in the clay. I get angry way too often, impatient way too quickly. I'm not always kind. Sometimes I keep track of too much stuff. Sometimes I don't say I'm sorry fast enough. I am 
marred, but I have given myself over to the hands of the potter so that he can, as Jeremiah says, shape me as it seems best to him, not as it seems best to me, as it seems best to him. So do you want to leave a legacy? Do you want to leave boldly? You have to consider what is the character of your life. Here's the third question. I have to ask myself, what will be the contribution of my life? When you break down the 7.6 billion people on this planet, there are only two types of people in the world. There are givers and there are takers. That's it. And no one will ever be positively remembered for what they've taken from this life. We will only ever be positively remembered for what we have given to this life. Now, you can think what you want about rich people. You, you, here's what I've discovered. Successful people seldom have a problem with other people's success. People who aren't successful or people who, who haven't achieved what it is they feel like they wanted to or feel like they haven't achieved what it is that they were meant to, those are the people who get frustrated with other people's success. And all it is is envy, which is one of the like, deadly sins. And so most successful people do not have a problem with other people's success. Bill Gates does not sit around thinking about Howard Schultz going, I stink and hate that guy's coffee. I wish he never would have. Like, uh-uh. He's like, hey, somebody get me a soy latte. I don't I just feel like Bill Gates probably doesn't do dairy. And so a few years ago, like 10, like 10 years ago, uh, at a nondescript place over dinner in a dark restaurant, two of the most wealthy, powerful men on the planet were having dinner, unbeknownst to the rest of us. Bill Gates and Warren Buffett were sitting over dinner talking about what it is they could do to maximize the impact of their wealth. Bill Gates thought that it was ridiculous that so few people have so much while so many people have so little. Huh, next time you turn on your computer, think about the fact that he was thinking about you. And so he looked at Warren Buffett and he said, bro, I don't know if he said bro, but he said, bro, we gotta do something about this. And so they came up with a plan, this is over a decade ago, and they called it the Giving Pledge. And the giving pledge was right there, just the two of them. They both agreed that they would take at least 50% of their net worth and they would give it away before they died. Like, did you know that this past week, Bill Gates donated $100 million to Corona Research? Like that's, and some of you say, well, yeah, I would too. Really? You haven't tithed ever, but you're going to give $100 million <laughs> to the Corona. But anyway, that's a whole, we're going to talk about that maybe next week. And so Bill just looks at, Warren and Warren says, yeah, bro, I'm in. And so then here's what they did. At the table, they both took their cell phones, probably not iPhones is all I'm saying. And so they took their phones and Bill probably uses an Android and they called some other rich people and they called like 10 rich people each, billionaires. And they asked them to do the same. And before they left that table, they had 22 people committed that they would give half of their net worth away before they died. And in the last decade, they have, there's 2,000 billionaires on earth, by the way. They haven't all agreed to do it, but 204 billionaires at last count have agreed that they will give away at least half of their net worth before they die to people who are in need. Now, here's the deal. I know you're not a billionaire, but what's your contribution? It's super easy. Your contribution is you. Your contribution is your uniqueness. There is no one else in the world like you. Never has been, never will be. Regardless of what your grandma used to tell you, you are not just one in a million. You aren't even just one in 7.6 billion. According to the Population Reference Bureau, since the beginning of the world, 108,760,543,791 people have been born. And so you, my friend, are one in 108,760,543,791. No one has ever been like you. No one has ever had your fingerprints, your voice print, or your footprint. There's no one else in the world like you. It's why the 139th Psalm says that you were fearfully and wonderfully made. If you won't be you, who will be? If you won't be you, the world is going to miss out. What God wants you to give back to the world is you. It's why we do growth track every week, because for some of you, no one can give out high fives like you. 
For others, no one can hold babies like you. For some of you, no one can chat on our online campus like you, while for others, no one can give money like you. My friends, Corey and Carrie, they feel like they were created to give money away, and they do that. And the more that they give away, the more that they can get so that they can give it away. That's their jam, that's their thing, that's their calling. What's yours? I'm just talking about your uniqueness. He wants you to give your gifts. He wants you to give your talents, your abilities. What are you giving? What are you contributing? Are you putting yourself at the center of the wheel? Are you letting Jesus shape and mold your character into his? Are you letting him remove the mar and mold you into a beautiful vessel to be used for his purpose and his plan? Why don't you do that today? If you want to leave a legacy, if, if you want to leave boldly, you have to do that. So why wait? Why not do it today? Because what if, God forbid, you really only had one month to live? All of the stuff that you're probably holding on to, you can't take it with you. You can't take your money with you. I had a friend that told me one time, I've never seen a hearse towing a U-Haul trailer. I thought, that's great. Unless you're a Pharaoh, you're not going to wake up with a bunch of stuff when you die. And guess what? You also can't take your anger with you. You can't take your bitterness with you. You can't take your hurt with you. You can't take your malice with you. You can't take your love with you. So why don't you just give it away before you go? You can't take your compliments with you. When you die, whatever compliments were left in your mouth when you died, you don't get to take those with you. You don't wake up on the other side giving them away. They're just words unsaid. The texts that you should have sent that you didn't send. The letters that you should have written that you didn't write. The, the, the love that you should have given away. You don't get to take that with you. And so put yourself at the center. Let Jesus make you. Let Jesus mold you. Let him form you into the image of him. Would you close your eyes all across this place? You know, salvation really is just putting yourself at the center of the wheel. It's taking your thoughts, it's taking your agendas, it's taking your desires and submitting them to the hand of the potter. And maybe you're here and you've never done that. Maybe you've been trying to figure the whole thing out on your own. Well, this morning, you're gonna get an opportunity to submit yourself to him. You're gonna get the opportunity to put yourself at the center of the wheel. And here's how, in just a moment, I'm gonna give people an opportunity to receive Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. And that's a very churchy word for just saying you're gonna surrender yourself to him. So this morning, we're gonna give you an opportunity to do the two things that you need to do to enter into a relationship with Jesus. And that is confess and profess. Confess that you're a sinner and profess that Jesus can fix that. So this morning, maybe you're here and you haven't done that. You haven't put yourself at the center of the wheel. This morning, with nobody looking around with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm gonna ask for people to do two things. First is in just a moment, I'm gonna ask you to confess, and here's how. I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand and make eye contact with me. And once you've made eye contact with me, you can put your hand down. That's your way of confessing that you're a sinner. Second, I'm gonna ask everybody in here to repeat a prayer after me. And if you repeat that prayer and you mean it in your heart, scripture says you will be saved. You get a relationship with Jesus. That's you professing that Jesus can fix you. And so, if you're here, Say, Sean, I am a sinner. I don't have a relationship with Jesus, but I want to receive him today with nobody looking around. Would you raise your hand and make eye contact with me right now? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Anybody else? Okay, I want everybody in here to say these words after me. Say, Jesus, I'm a sinner and I'm sorry please forgive me. Come into my life, change me, make me new, be my Lord, be my Savior, in Jesus' name. Amen. Friend, if you, if you prayed that prayer, would you do us a favor? Just take the hello card that we talked about earlier, tear off the bottom part, fill in whatever information you're okay with us having, and check the box that's highlighted in yellow that says, I'm choosing to follow Jesus. Put it in the black buckets when they come around at the end, or you can take it to the Welcome Center. We just want the chance to pray. If you're going to ask you to close your eyes again, we have two more things, so don't leave yet. I want you to close your eyes real quick. I wonder if you're here and you say, I'm a Jesus guy or I'm a Jesus girl, but you know that you've been holding back. You have not been contributing yourself. Maybe that's in your marriage. Maybe that's with your kids. Maybe that's here. Maybe that's at your job or school, wherever that may be. You'd say, Sean, I've been going halfway. I haven't been all in. I'm going to heaven. 
but I haven't been contributing and I need to. With nobody looking around, do you raise your hand right now so that I can pray for you? Yes, yes. Jesus, for so many people in this place, God, move us, motivate us. God, make us into the people that you want us to be. God, we submit ourselves and surrender ourselves to you. Help us be contributors in Jesus' name. Amen.